Good morning. It's Tuesday, June 1st, 2010. My name is Jim Mayola, and it is my pleasure to be interviewing Solomon Hoke. Solomon, you tell me that you're 85 years old. And I will be 85 years old November the 1st, which is All Saints Day uh, in the Catholic Church, which uh, I now am a member of the St. John's Catholic Church in Westminster. Uh, you're looking at the superintendent of Jerusalem Church in uh, Bachman's Valley, okay. which I served, and that's the reason I have the same wife of 62 years. Fantastic. Uh, uh, we came from, I was born in Bonneville, Pennsylvania, which is Union Township, and my father was in the egg business as a farmer uh, during the First World War. He was a student at your Sinus College, uh, studying to be a Protestant minister. And when the war ended in 1918, uh, his uh, ROTC was ended, and his scholarship to the ministry was ended, and he went to farming for his uncle in Adams County, uh, Pennsylvania, known as the Felty Schoolhouse Farm. Okay. And we came to Maryland in 19... Uh, he bought the farm in 1930. In 1932, we moved to, which is now 1801 Bachman Valley Road. Mm -hmm. and bought that from the uh, uh, Frock Farm, the Ezra Frock Farm. Now, how many acres did you have? In that particular farm, it was 125 acres at the time. Okay. And what did you farm? Uh, when we came there, we, my father was uh, a great believer in cooperatives, and he was one of the founders of the Penn Carroll Cooperative at Melrose. Mm -hmm. And we raised a lot of tomatoes and a lot of sweet corn, for the canning company, mm -hmm. but uh, we were never in the dairy business because my father always said dairy farming is a man of a slave, and we had beef cattle, and when we moved to the farm in uh, 1932, uh, we had no electricity. We had uh, we had two pumps, mm -hmm. uh, which were both uh, Eberg pumps from uh, the great Eberg uh, pump people in Manchester. And one of my jobs before I went to school was to pump uh, water for 40 head of steers before I got a, uh, walked a mile to get on the school bus. No kidding. And so this was part of the job. And on the farm, uh, then we went to uh, uh, wheat, barley, and raised the feed for the cattle, which we were in the heavy beef cattle business. Mm -hmm. Now, you said you raised uh, sweet corn and tomatoes for the cannery. For the the can cannery was in Melrose? In Melrose. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, in uh, the Penn Carroll uh, was one of, oh, I guess probably six or seven canning factories in Carroll County. Uh, there were tomato factories, which was one of the big uh, things at that time. And the Penn Carroll Cooperative was a group of farmers that uh, got a cooperative charter and began to produce uh, 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 commodities under their own label, Penn Carroll Cooperative. Mm -hmm. And of course, it started making money, but like most cooperatives, that uh, if you don't have sturdy management, right. uh, when you make a little profit, everybody wants their fair share, right. and the fair share is not always enough to, uh, to reimburse everything of the expenses. Mm -hmm. And it eventually was sold uh, for uh, uh, whatever it was worth. Now you say you also raise grain, grain on your on your farm. Yeah, wheat and uh, barley. Mm -hmm. uh, barley was used for feed, and uh, wheat was sold to the mill mm -hmm. for, uh, and it went to Hampstead uh, at the old flour mill at uh, by the railroad tracks, where it was shipped. Most of it went overseas, mm -hmm. and it was sold to a broker that uh, went directly uh, for import. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, how old were you when you moved into Carroll County? You were young. Well, man. born in 1925, so I was a total of uh, six years, seven years old. Okay, so you really grew up, came of age yeah. in Carroll County. Right. Tell me about grade school. What was that like? Well, that is a very interesting uh, session in my life. I went one year to the Bachman's Mills School, which is uh, right at the corner of uh, the old Frederick County, Carroll County line. Mm -hmm. The dividing line between the two counties, Frederick County and Carroll County, is right at Bachman's Mills, okay. where, that, where that mill is. And I, uh, my first year was in the Bachman's Valley School, and there was two of us in the first grade. 
and uh, the Roser boy that was one of them. He was my buddy, and we had a very important job. Uh, he carried the coal, and I carried the water for the school. No we had to hand pump the water for the school, right? And uh, we we carry the coal for the coal stove, mm -hmm. and so that was my first year. My second year of education was in the Union Mills Academy, which is in uh, Union Mills, which is now an antique store. Mm -hmm. And the reason I spent the second grade there uh, is because the Car uh, Charles Carroll School had burned down, had, had, had a serious fire, mm -hmm. and they were not able to open it in 33. Okay. And so I spent one year in the second grade in Union Mills and then went to Charles Carroll from the third grade until the ninth grade. And then in the ninth grade, I transferred to uh, the Westminster uh, School and was in, uh, they had no place to put us when we came from Charles Carroll, because at that time we only had 11 grades. Right. And so the 10th and 11th grade, uh, I was in Mike Eaton's room. That's where I was uh, staffed. And, and of course, Mike Eaton was an English teacher, mm -hmm. and that, that's, I graduated in 1942. How large of a class did you have when you were at um, Charles Carroll School? In Charles Carroll School, uh, we had uh, what seven uh, seven grades, which were the elementary school, mm -hmm. and then we had the two grades, which uh, 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 three grades, which are seven, eight, and nine, which were the junior high. Mm -hmm. And in the elementary school, we had about thirty in that class, and then in the high school, we had uh, about twenty-two. Mm -hmm. And then when we came to Westminster, there was only, I think, uh, nine of us that came from Charles Carroll that finished. Uh, mm -hmm. The rest of them had dropped out, right. what was left of it. So it was a different world. Class yep. sizes were much smaller. Yeah, mm -hmm. right, it was. And we had uh, wonderful teachers. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, and one of the, the reasons that I stopped in here, we are having our 67th uh, high school reunion uh, which is only of the graduating class of 1942, there was 137. From but, Westminster. From Westminster. Mm -hmm. But there's uh, only about 35 left. Right. And so if, if you don't uh, turn 80 years of age, it's no use you showing up because <laughs> you, you'd be out of step. That's right. So what kinds of things did you learn in Charles Carroll? What kind of subjects did you have? Well, we had... Uh, one of the first things that uh, was set up at Charles Carroll, the Future Farmers of America became mm -hmm. along as one of the very, very great uh, activities. And even today, the FFA and the 4-H pro programs are in, I would say, almost in direct conflict of one another. Mm -hmm. They do work together harmoniously, mm -hmm. but the uh, FFA is a part of state education right. and the 4-H is a part of the Federal Extension Service, which is, uh, and it's quite unique as you grew, uh, grew older and you see these two things. And most of my formal education came through 4-H activities uh, mm -hmm. uh, later. Mm -hmm. But in the FFA program at Charles Carroll, uh, we were obliged to have a portable shop set up mm -hmm. for our workshop, uh, manual workshop, and for our FFA activities, and uh, we had quite a quite a following in in that. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about what chores you had growing up on the farm? What kinds of things you did? Well, being uh, uh, what you'd call labor on the farm, being from Pennsylvania, our whole family is uh, uh, from the Pennsylvania area, and there's one philosophical thing that uh, our family had. Uh, no worky, no eaty. And uh, so we had chores uh, every day. Uh, I had the uh, uh, chicken and hog operation. We had our own hogs where we killed our own uh, uh, pork. Mm -hmm. And we had our own chickens because we were marketing eggs mm -hmm. is one of the stories that uh, my father had with the, uh, uh, he was selling white eggs to a New York market with a premium uh, uh, market price. And one of the people uh, were, who owned the farm, which we now own, uh, they had lost their father uh, with seven children and uh, with tuberculosis at a young age, and he had no will. Mm. And the farm was, and one of the boys had a egg route in Pikesville, and he learned that my father was selling eggs to New York. 
and he had a clientele in Pikesville with the Jewish uh, 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 group, and he wanted an opportunity to get a crate of eggs a, uh, a week mm -hmm. for his Pikesville operation. Right. And that's how we came about to be moving to Maryland. No. Because after five years of negotiation of the farm in Bachman's Valley, my father bought it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's how one of the many jobs. My brother, who is now deceased, he was in the military in the Philippines and had a pretty rugged life going through. But we each had jobs to do before we went to school in the morning. And during uh, the, the school year, the high school years, we left school at noontime to go home to work on the farm. No kidding. And many times I would be hitchhiking home from Westminster High School and Dr. S uh, ba uh, Dr. Bear here in town would, had the farm out in Bachman's Valley and he'd pick us up, take mm -hmm. us out to the farm and drop us off. Yeah. How interesting. So you went to school as in high school in Westminster. Right. Two years. Okay. Okay. What was Westminster like? Now, what years were they? That would have been well. 40 1942 is when we graduated. Okay, so 41 and 42. Or 41, 42. What was Westminster like in 1941 and 42? Well, at that time, uh, they had no no traffic lights of any kind, and we had uh, uh, three uh, uh, police officers uh, and uh, Sipe and Charlie Bars. Uh, we always c called him the German uh, general because. He rode around in a motorcycle and had a sidecar, mm -hmm. and uh, he would ride in the sidecar and one of his uh, uh, aides. Uh, and Saturday night uh, was always a strange part of uh, Westminster. You'd have the Saturday night march, which would be many of the rural people would come to, to town and would do shopping, and they'd walk the streets visiting mm -hmm. one another. Mm -hmm. And my brother used to get angry and say, well, why don't we go? Uh, 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 walking with the people, and my father said, "Well, we have more important things to do than uh, walking the streets of Westminster." And the streets, many night uh, times, were crowded during the early uh, uh, 39, 40, and 41 mm -hmm. uh, before the war. And then, of course, uh, once uh, the war started, why, well, of course, uh, it became a different rallying point. Mm -hmm. So, what was it like during the war? Tell me, tell me a little bit about that. Well, it was difficult. Uh, my brother had one year uh, deferment for the Glenham Martin Company. Uh, my brother became an outstanding machinist and was taught by Samuel Coltrider, who was a noted uh, teacher in uh, uh, his activity. And uh, my brother was working at the uh, feed mill at uh, Penn Carroll at Melrose. And Sam Coltrider called him one day and said the uh, Glenelg Martin Company was looking for a master machinist. And uh, he went down and was working on the B-26 bomber. And he had one year deferment uh, mm -hmm. at the VF, uh, at Plant 2 mm -hmm. in Middle River where he worked on the uh, bomber. And then, of course, uh, selective service got to the point where, and I wasn't old enough then yet, I was two years younger than my brother, and of course, I didn't get into the selective service system at that time mm -hmm. until uh, the next uh, two years later. Then, of course, I was deferred mm -hmm. for farm activity, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was tough work. But uh, and one of the things that I was telling when I came in to uh, talk to your receptionist, uh, Ron Brewer and I were on a trip recently, and we were talking about the the theaters mm -hmm. and. Uh, in the article that uh, is in there, it said that Carroll Theater had a balcony. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, that is not correct, because uh, Westminster at that time had th three theaters. Okay. The opera building, which was up at uh, Court Street, right. and we had the State Theater, which is now John Street. Mm -hmm. It was torn down to make way for an intersection. And during the 39, uh, 38 and 39, my brother and I would take our weekly pay, which was a quarter, and we'd come into Westminster and buy, take one of our quarters and buy a bag of grapes for a quarter from the April uh, uh, grocery store and then go to the State Theater and buy a 10-cent ticket and go to the balcony. Mm -hmm. Now, in the State Theater, only the blacks were allowed to sit in the State Theater. Mm -hmm. And in order for us to be conservative and save our money, we'd sit up on the 
on the second uh, balcony, mm -hmm. and my brother always said, well, it was dark. He said, we didn't know the difference. We went to see the movies. That's right. And uh, so it, it was a great experience. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Yeah. Tell me what else was on Main Street in, when you were a youngster? Well, you had the, uh, the Gear uh, hardware store, mm -hmm. which uh, was done at the corner of Liberty and Main. Uh, one of the things that at that time was a, a very outstanding, uh, I guess you'd call it a versatile store, was Hollanders. Mm -hmm. And Hollanders uh, would have uh, uh, automotive uh, parts, uh, supplies, uh, I guess it was what you called nowadays a Walmart uh, store, but it was a very low, and you had uh, you had four major hardware stores on Main Street, uh, Westminster Hardware, which and uh, it it was and where the uh, one of the outstanding things is today you have the B B and T Bank, which is at the corner of Bond and Main, right, and that had the Richardson Feed Company. And I can remember my uh, uh, wife's mother uh, lived on Bond Street in one of the Rupp apartments. And when they would grind feed, you could sit on the front porch and see the, the, the uh, uh, dust coming out of the mill. Sure. And that gave way. And then, of course, you had uh, uh, automobile agencies. You had the Buick uh, agency right down the, uh, the street across from Westminster Hardware. Mm -hmm. And But, uh, of course, the... Uh, Rail traffic at that time was very heavy. During the war, it was very heavy, and uh, coming through Westminster, and it was quite quite something to see many trains that would come in with four engines and a hundred cars. No kidding. And uh, because coming into Westminster from uh, New Windsor, uh, coming up that grade it was one of the steepest grades that they had coming into Westminster, and I can remember some of the lads that uh, you used to know that lived here in Westminster used to talk about taking cup grease down to the railroad tracks coming into Westminster mm -hmm. and would uh, put the cup grease on the rails and the uh, train would hang up with, uh, and you could hear the wheels uh, spinning, spinning. Yep. and they had to use extra sand, sand to yep. get them up the hill. <laughs> and uh, I had never been involved in anything that notorious, and I call it notorious. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Those were rambunctious kids. Uh, well. Mm -hmm. At uh, that time, you didn't have a whole lot to do. Yeah, there was no uh, no organized playgrounds in right. any of the right. that you have today. Now we had a regular train station there, so there was a lot of train traffic coming through. You said, but but there were also passenger passenger trains. Yes. Okay, passenger. There was trains. at least four passenger trains a day mm -hmm. that uh, went south. Two went south and two went north. And uh, when I uh, went to work for the Maryland Foreign Bureau. Uh, right after we were married, I would get the train here in Westminster and mm -hmm. take it down to uh, to my office at that time with the Maryland Foreign Bureau, where I worked for 10 years, uh, was at the Ecuador building, and I'd take the train to Baltimore. Which no kidding. And one of the greatest things of riding the train is to hear the conductor calling the stations, and uh, he'd come in each coach, you know, and you'd hear this conductor holler, Walbrook, uh, Glendon. And it's, but it was, it was, it was good traffic, mm -hmm. good traffic. Mm -hmm. Times have changed. Right. Very much so. Now, uh, during the war, I understand we had rationing. How did it, how did it affect you on the farm? Well, one of the things, and that was one of the, my jobs uh, on the farm, was to take care of the rationing gas supply. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had an A card for our passenger car. And uh, my brother had a C card because he was working in the, the Glen o Martin, still living at home, living, mm -hmm. and, and he had a C card. Uh, an A card was three gallons a week that you were allowed to get. And then we had the uh, T card, which was uh, for trucks. Okay. And then we had a, a, there was a special arrangement for farm mm -hmm. uh, operations and uh, you had to estimate about what you were going to use in the crop that you used and uh, but we never ran out of gas mm -hmm. and it was because it was a priority and uh, rationing one of the the greatest things that uh, uh, when the war first started back in the old days uh, when you were plowing uh, with a two-row plow or a three-row plow 
when the plowshares would wear out, you'd take them out, throw them in the uh, landslide, mm -hmm. and uh, put on new ones. Mm -hmm. Well, when the war came along, they were sought after quite a bit. Sure. And uh, my brother was injured in the South Pacific by a piece of shrapnel and refused to take a, a, a wounded warrior uh, award. He said, no. He said, I got hit with a piece of shrapnel. And he said, I'm sure it was my plowshares from the farm. And he said, it didn't hurt, so I won't take the, uh, the, the medical. That's an amazing and story. Uh, so, uh, but that was one of the stories that he told from the war. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, rationing at that time was unique when you couldn't uh, use, uh, uh, at that time, uh, in butter, uh, butter came along and you couldn't use coloring. Well, for margarine, right? Uh, you had to buy a coloring because the dairy industry uh, said that was prohibitive to have margarine and gold color and and competition with butter. But mm -hmm. that also passed, mm -hmm. and uh, it's amazing how you scoured everything in your neighborhood, uh, aluminum and copper and things that, and most times you just gave it away for the war effort. Sure, mm -hmm. and but time goes on. People were very patriotic right. then. Mm -hmm. Now, what else was rationed besides uh, gasoline? Sugar? Yeah. And Sugar was very, very uh, extensively rationed because of the uh, need to make uh, ethanol out of it, uh, fuel. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, well, meat was rationed too to a certain extent. And uh, uh, But you had a lot of country butchers, which, uh, uh, which of course we had our own. We mm -hmm. did our own butchering of sure. pork, mm -hmm. and we killed the beef every year, and mm -hmm. uh, so you had your own supply of food. Right. But my mother uh, canned a lot of things: tomatoes, beans, and dried corn, sun-dried corn, mm -hmm. and that was the old system, the Pennsylvania mm -hmm. way of preserving food. Well, people used to preserve everything. Right. You know, That's right. And put it up for the for the winter, and then. Right. When the garden started producing again, you'd eat again. Yeah. We got electricity on the farm in 1937, so we moved there in 33. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll never forget the day that we turned on the electric. And of course, the house had been wired soon after the uh, uh, house had been, the farm had been purchased. But the uh, cost of installation, the house was 900 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, off of the road, and uh, my father said he would not pay that kind of a fee, and he was very active in or in the Farm Bureau, uh, and at that time, even the Farmers Union, which right. we had uh, a following in uh, uh, Carroll County, and uh, my father said, well, he'd go see the congressman and see about, uh, in Pennsylvania, we were only a mile and a half from the Pennsylvania line, mm -hmm. and he'd get a waiver sign from the uh, Pennsylvania REA, Rural Electrification Administration, to bring him REA electricity over the Pennsylvania line. And within 24 hours, we had three uh, gas and electric trucks in our driveway and said to my father, if you will give us a check for a certain amount, we'll turn the electricity on tomorrow. Wow. And that's how in 19, June of 1937 is when the electric lights went on, mm -hmm. and it wasn't long after that we had running water, mm -hmm. which we didn't have to run out a half a uh, 500 feet to the pump and pump it. Right. And So how about refrigeration? How did you refrigerate your food, or did you? We had spring house. Okay. We had a spring house, and as most everything was cooled, and we never had a nice uh, box, but... Uh, uh, my wife's family had uh, an ice box, and they had a, an ice man that came every two days and brought mm -hmm. a block of ice. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had a spring house, and canning was the thing that you, you generally uh, made t time with. So you had a big pantry. Yep, mm -hmm. big pantry, right. Mm -hmm. okay. And a root cellar? We had a smokehouse, mm -hmm. and we had an ice house, okay. but we never filled the ice house because uh, uh, my father always said that... Uh, most of the ice houses were used probably to make ice cream in the summertime than they were to uh, do refrigeration because it was so much work to, to, uh, to keep it going. Right. But there was an ice house on the farm. 
How did you keep the uh, house warm in the winter? That uh, was done by, uh, uh, in the uh, main parlor, there was a heat troller, which they we used coal. Mm -hmm. uh, we got anthracite coal, which was the, coal, uh, the hottest burning coal. And then in the uh, kitchen was a cook stove. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, at first, it was just a cook stove that made uh, heat, did the cooking. And it had, later on, my uh, father had uh, put a water jacket mm -hmm. inside the, the burn box and uh, made hot water. And then that went upstairs to the bathtub, which was put on at a later time. The, the house didn't get the bathtub uh, indoors until 1940. No kidding. And, uh, but uh, it was all part of, uh, well, as you'd say, primitive life today. But uh, uh, he learned how to appreciate uh, uh, those things that came about. And as we look at the 21st century, and I tell so often that anybody that lived in the 20th century had the greatest time of their life because it's when it changed from what it was and now it's so modern that uh, it's frightening. Yes, it is. Well, Solomon, it's, it looks like you made out all right. You, uh, you, you seem to be healthy and you survived with no running water as a child yeah. and, 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 pro and no, no indoor plumbing and, uh, and you seem to be healthy and hale and hearty. Well, I'm in pretty good shape for the shape I'm in. We had an uh, old family doctor, Dr. Danner in Manchester. Mm -hmm. That when somebody got too ill, he'd be called and he'd come out and give her whatever it was. And, mm -hmm. uh, it was, uh, and we always laughed about, you know, people worry so much about the food they eat. And my father always said, well, if you don't eat a little bacteria, there's no way in the world you can stay healthy because you, you, you learn, your body learns how to, to grow with it. And what did you do for entertainment? Well, in that time, uh, the Saturday night was generally we went to the movies mm -hmm. because uh, in those days you always had a 15-week uh, special Western uh, movie that was on, Tim McCoy or Tom Mix or somebody like that, and they'd show 10 minutes of the, of the serial every week for the 15 weeks, and okay. you had to come to the movies on Saturday night to, to see how the movie would, uh, how the serial would come along. And, but then of course the, we joined the 4-H club, and this is one of the things that really, really made, uh, and one of the greatest things that happened to us in the 4-H club, when uh, during the war years, it was probably 43 or 44, uh, we had a, a home demonstration agent Justina Crosby, who was from Connecticut, and uh, she came to us one day and said, uh, hey, you guys, there's not many fellows left on the farm, said, uh, if you will get uh, eight couples together, uh, I have a friend who uh, teaches dancing, and said, uh, my friend is uh, Mrs. Rutan, who has the uh, Chevrolet sales operation in uh, Westminster, and she is a former uh, rockette, and she said she'll teach you how to uh, to dance. Well, we got eight couples together, and we started dancing, and lo and behold, one of the uh, uh, person in that group was Nellie Getty, who was from New Windsor, and she and I liked to step together, and she became my wife in, no kidding. in 1948, and it was uh, quite an interesting uh, lesson, and Donald Dell was one of the uh, uh, dance people in that and of course uh, his wife was also a product uh, 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 a frock the frock girl and so he liked uh, Miss Nellie Getty too and I was able to overpower him with the fact that I was a, a, a better dancer than he was and even to this day he, we still laugh about it because uh, and so the same wife of 62 years is still the same dancer that I had then as, as I had today. What a wonderful story. Now, do you and your wife ever go out dancing now? Mostly to uh, birthday parties or to uh, wedding. Uh, with uh, We have seven children and, of course, uh, 20 grandchildren, and the marriages do come along, and that do provide us some very cheap dance uh, opportunities. That's wonderful. Now, what did you dance to? What kind of music did you dance to? The, the modern music, mm -hmm. which... Uh, 
we we never did do any of the uh, what they call uh, the Nashville dancing, right? The uh, polkas and and those kind of things. It was the, the modern dancing, uh, which was uh, the two step and mm -hmm. something that was accommodating for us. Right. Now, would you dance to swing music? Was it like yes. big, ba yeah. big band music? Yeah, okay. big band music. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we then the big bands came along, Harry James, mm -hmm. and. Uh, then some of the uh, counties in the state of Maryland had uh, once a year they'd invite a big band in mm -hmm. and have a big frolic yeah. and uh, but we moved to Caroline County in 1949 mm -hmm. and lived there for uh, eight years and moved from Caroline County to Queen Anne County as mm -hmm. an agent for Nationwide Insurance and mm -hmm. then went to Wilmington Delaware as a manager for Nationwide and then transferred to Baltimore as a manager and uh, got dissatisfied with management and said I could be happier selling uh, mm -hmm. to people and supervising. Sure. And I finished uh, as an agent uh, 40 years with Nationwide. And then you came back to Carroll County. Yeah, I came back to Carroll County. Bought the home place in 72 and built a new house in 1980. Mm -hmm. Where we live today. You moved home. Yeah, moved yeah, home. We did. Yes. Well, I can't think of a nicer place to live than Carroll right. County. Well, it's it's different, and uh, uh, it's very, very conservative, mm -hmm. and it does not move as rapidly. Uh, I was involved in politics in Baltimore County, and uh, it's, in fact, I had the, uh, I was telling the hostess here when I came in that one of the things that I have in my possession today is a notary seal that I still have and I got from Ted Agnew when he was county executive no kidding. in Baltimore County. Yeah. And uh, I had need need for a uh, notary seal, and he uh, provided the data for the mm -hmm. state of Maryland, and I have that today. So I rarely use it, but I use it for family when they have problems and need it. And people say, well, uh, I'm almost obliged to say, well, this is an antique model. I would say. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, Sullivan, what's the biggest change you've seen since growing up in Carroll County as a boy to today? Well, looking at what is taking place politically, I am very concerned about the five commissioner thing uh, coming forth because, uh, unfortunately, they, when the bill was put through, the people were not really told that they would not be voting countywide. They're going to be voting on a district. And this is going to cause some real problems politically that uh, we will probably have three or four years before we'll overcome it. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the great things is that uh, uh, there's entirely too much government encroachment uh, in the lives of doing for people what people should be doing for themselves mm -hmm. because it seems to be get so easy to say, well, it's not my job, let government do it. And uh, as you study the things that were available and what taxes are, uh, the, the system does not necessarily say that it's going to be an easy way because my father, grandfather, parents who were uh, all lived in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. had one philosophy. There is no such thing as a free lunch. And whatever kind of lunch you're going to have, however you decide to make it a banquet, it has a price tag. Absolutely and make sure that you understand what your price tag is. Absolutely. Well, Mr. Hope, it was a real pleasure speaking to you today. Thank you so much for coming in. It's a pleasure to know that you're here doing this because only what we've seen before will be able to see. And I was telling Terry when they came in, uh, my father was the first uh, person that had contour farming. Mm -hmm. And two of the neighbors came over. They knew that my father was in the seminary at your sinus to be a, a minister, and one of the neighbors came over and put their arms around him and said, Mr. Hope, you're not to be known as a drinking man. What are you doing your farm, farm like this? And he took a look and he said, my dear man, I'm making border walk down the hill. And with that, and even today, the contours, we put the farm uh, in ag preservation yep. because I said to my dad before he passed on, I said, one of the things I will do, I will make sure that there are no cupolos put on this house, but it will remain as agricultural land. Fantastic. Because when we got there, it had been sharecropped mm -hmm. for five years and had been badly eroded. Mm -hmm. 
And for many, many days, I can remember hauling sod from the pasture farms and filling, uh, filling up the, uh, the gullies. Right. And today it's, but that's all part of life. Exactly. Well, again, thank you, Mr. Hope. Really appreciate you right. taking the time to come in, and we'll save your uh, message for posterity. Children and others will be able to hear thank you. what it was like. Glad to make Carol my Hope. comments available to those who need to listen. Thank you so much. Right.